there's a lot to like in this program. And I think they're uh, planning to sort of follow the model of what you saw in the UK in the 80s and 90s, where a lot of uh, nationalized companies and uh, transportation and medicine and healthcare and uh, a wide range of sectors were, were privatized and they plan to go much further than that. And they've looked at models in Australia and Canada that are still very active in privatizing um, and they're trying to uh, radically transform their economy. And so I'm expecting there will be a seismic shift in the next five, ten years and we'll see a totally different landscape. This is the 966. This is the 966 episode 45. Richard, hello. How you doing? Hello, 45. I got it wrong. I think I, I must have lost track. So I'm in my notes, so I'll have to go back and redo my notes. Well, they just fly by, you know, they, they just, they, they've just flown <laughs> they by. <do. laughs> this week, we'll be talking about the World Economic Forum in Davos and all the news from that. A uh, strong Saudi delegation in Switzerland this week, Richard. A collection of stories as well f- this week on the U.S.-Saudi relationship and much more. And in just a moment, we'll be getting to our conversation with now repeat guest Chris Johnson, managing attorney at the law firm Johnson & Pump in association with Al-Sharif Law Firm. Really awesome conversation. Stay tuned for that coming up shortly. Before we get started, Please subscribe to this podcast wherever you're getting it, YouTube, or if you're listening to the audio version where many of our listeners come from, Spotify, Apple Podcast. Hit the subscribe button so you don't have to look for us and download us each week. We would really appreciate it. Richard, what's your one big thing this week? Oh, well, before we get there, you, you mentioned our listeners, and they are, they're, they're, they're popping. They're, they're really growing quickly. I feel like I should give a shout out to my mom, who is one of our earliest and most steadfast listeners. Mm-hmm. Uh, she spent four and a half years in Saudi Arabia. She loved it. And she, she loved, I always loved our newsletter. She's always calling and, and, and commenting about how things are changing in Saudi Arabia. And it's so amazing to see everything. And she just, you know, loves this podcast. And I just wanted to give her a shout out. Yeah. You're, 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 you're awesome. Mom. Thanks. A shout out to Mrs. Wilson. Yes. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, our one big thing, uh, my one big thing, uh, you referenced it, the World Economic Forum, WEF, met this week in Davos, Switzerland for the first time in person since January 2021. Having been postponed several times, this is the first springtime iteration of the WEF. It's kind of interesting to see it, and there's no snow on the ground. Uh, and this year's theme is, quote, history at a turning point of gov- government policies and business strategies, unquote. Despite the WEF's Chief Economist very, very gloomy outlook report that forecasts lower economic activity, higher inflation, lower real wages, and greater food insecurity globally in 2022, and pointed to the devastating human consequences of the fragmentation of the global economy. Despite this, it has been sort of a coming out party for Saudi Arabia. And not only because Saudi Arabia branded multiple cafes along the main drag in Davos, which I gather (laughs) is 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 a thing including one bearing Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's name. Um, uh, WF President uh, Borg Brenda praised the strong delegation from Saudi Arabia featuring seven ministers, including the foreign minister, finance minister, economy and planning minister, minister of investment, minister of communications, and information technology, and the assistant minister for tourism. Uh, Davos, Davos maven and mainstay George Soros, Soros uh, suggested that China and represent China and Russia represent the greatest threat to open society, and that while just a few years ago he would have put Saudi Arabia in that group, he now believes the kingdom's transformation could tilt the divide the other way. Uh, the WF, WEF also recognized Saudi Arabia in its latest travel and tourism development index, which ranks Saudi Arabia 34th among more than 100 countries for development, sustainability, and resiliency in industry a 10-mark jump from pre-pandemic levels. Um, as we have discussed on this show, uh, Saudi Arabia likes these, takes these types of reputable annual or biannual global rating reports quite seriously, and this will make them very happy. Uh, in our world, the United States, coverage and discussion of Saudi Arabia mostly consists of hammering the kingdom on human rights, Yemen, Jamal Khashoggi, and uh, not doing what we want on oil production. In Davos... 
The focus has been on Saudi Arabia as an economic bright spot in a dismal global picture, a country with the world's second highest projected rate of growth in 2022, one that is rapidly and substantially transforming its economy and society, a G20 member that will surpass $1 trillion in GDP this year for the first time and is working to move up from the world's 19th largest economy to 15th by 2030, uh, one that aspires to be a global player, not just a regional or Arab leader. And I suspect that uh, this has been a very refreshing, uplifting week in Switzerland for Saudi leadership. There's quite the lineup of ministers. It looks like at least five ministers from Saudi Arabia were there. Um, I mean, there was a panel uh, moderated by the CEO of APCO Worldwide that featured all of these ministers on one panel discussing Vision 2030 and what's ahead. I think the word that you use, Richard, was bright spot. I think that's a perfect word for that. Yeah, there's not a not a lot of happy stories right now in the globe, and no. and Saudi Arabia, for a number of reasons, is uh, is has caught the wave uh, such as it is, and it, I think it's feeling very confident. And it's interesting when you watch that that video of that panel that you just referenced. You know how they uh, number one, they're all extremely competent, very articulate, very confident in in their presentation, but they're all on the same page. Um. Yeah, and I don't know if it's because they drank the Kool-Aid. Everybody needs to be on the same page if you're representing a government. But, you know, they're talking about Vision 2030, which they know inside out. They've all deeply committed and invested. I just think it's it's just interesting to watch Saudi Arabia as it gains confidence. And it's, it's you know, it's being reinforced and reaffirmed right now, obviously, because the commodity super cycle and the revenues are huge. But also because it's you know handled the pandemic so well, the, the economy is growing, it's diversifying. They're achieving a lot of their goals, their metrics as they move towards 2030 in terms of the vision 2030. It's it you know the, the confidence is palpable. What do you what's your one big thing? My one big thing this week, Richard. Three noteworthy developments in the U.S. Saudi G to G relationship taking place this week. I wanted to kind of run through them first. A flurry of reported diplomatic activity involving the transfer of two islands, the Tehran and Sanafir Islands, from Egypt to Saudi Arabia, may lead ultimately to normalized relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Those talks are being brokered by diplomats from the Biden administration, according to a report by Axios. Either way, it is an achievement for the Biden administration just in playing a role in those talks. And of course, it would be a significant foreign policy win for the Biden administration if it does lead to a normalization of relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia. So there's that. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that, Richard, later in today's show, since we think it deserves its own discussion. Second is a visit by three Republican members of Congress to Saudi Arabia this week, which included a meeting directly with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, Chris Stewart from Utah, Guy Reschenthaler from Pennsylvania and Lisa McLean from Michigan all met directly with the crown prince uh, and Saudi Arabia's ambassador to the United States, Princess Rima bin Bandar, also attended along with former ambassador and minister of state Adel al Jaber. No meaningful details were released from the meeting, of course, but it's still very interesting that it took place. And third, still not a done deal yet, but another Axios report said this week that top Biden officials are also in Saudi Arabia for broader talks including to arrange for a potential visit by the president to Saudi Arabia in June, which would be huge. Three current and former U.S. officials told Axios that two of President Biden's senior advisors are on a, quote, secret visit to Saudi Arabia for talks about (laughs) not only the uh, reportedly secret about not only the islands transfer that I just mentioned, but also a deal to increase oil production and Washington and Riyadh's bilateral relationship. According to the report, President Biden is considering visiting Saudi Arabia as part of his planned trip to the Middle East at the end of June. Getting a package of understandings between the United States and Saudi Arabia on these issues is crucial for the visit to take place, the sources told Axios. Taking a step back, Richard, what we're looking at here is clearly no longer the low point in U.S.-Saudi relations in recent years that we just saw. Uh, Some would say that we reached it earlier this year in 2022 as oil prices surged and the Saudis reportedly would not take President Biden's phone call. Just an opinion here, but I think that uh, narrative in the media today that the president, quote, promised to treat Saudi Arabia as a pariah on the campaign trail is as being a huge problem for Saudi Arabia is not really the issue. I think Saudi leaders know that U.S. politicians say things they don't mean all the time, such as the nature of democratic elections. I mean, President Trump absolutely blasted the Saudis on several occasions on the campaign trail before a surprise election win. And even as president, even as President Trump said, he told King Salman that, quote, we're protecting you. You might not be there for two weeks without us. You have to pay for your military. 
which is hard to even address as a statement because of its <laughs> both wholly inaccurate and offensive. But Richard, I think talk is cheap. And the Trump administration had a close relationship with Saudi Arabia, despite Trump's bluster and outbursts. Saudi Arabia was his first trip overseas, as you remember. And when U.S. officials visited Saudi Arabia, they weren't doing so in secret, as the Axios, Axios report said. So what I think actually matters is the is not words, but actions. President Biden said what he said on the campaign trail, but what really matters is his actions. He wouldn't engage with Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman at all before he had his back against the wall with oil prices. And so we love highlighting our themes on this podcast, Richard. And I think one of them is that the U.S.-Saudi relationship is so deep and rooted that there is almost a disassociation now, or it feels like one, between the political relationship as viewed through the media and the actual ties between the countries. And that's why I highlighted these stories this week. Um, the U.S.-Saudi military relationship is still very strong. The U.S. and Saudi Arabia still have shared defense and security interests. U.S. businesses have helped build and grow the kingdom over the decades and still do. And culturally, the two nations have a long history and many Saudis, especially the hundreds of thousands who studied here in the U.S., consider the U.S. a second home. So, Richard, we'll just have to see what happens next here with the Biden visit, the islands transfer, which, again, we'll talk about in a little bit. But there's a lot of momentum now, and it sort of seems like that low point is far behind us. Well, they're never far away. Um, that's the nature of these things, mm -hmm. and and True. you know, some global circumstance will will force a, a point of contention. Um, but that's a big one. That's a good one. You got you got, you got <laughs> a lot. Of one in there. <laughs> and yeah, we'll hold off on the San, the Santa Fe and Tehran uh, island business for the yellow. Uh, you know, it it, uh, it was interesting. This, uh, the the members of of Congress who who arrived in in Riyadh to visit with uh, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, not surprisingly, all from the Republican Party, mm -hmm. um, which speaks to an issue that uh, President Biden has, which is, you know, its own party is particularly uh, vocal in criticism about Saudi Arabia. So, um, you know, he has to deal with that. Um, and I agreed. I think you, you, we do make a frequent point that at the institutional level, things proceed and, and the relationship is tended to and, and often strengthened. Uh, you know, we have had a political impasse. I think it's interesting, and you 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 make a fair point that the Saudis are always in play during the campaign season, and you know the Saudis are aware of this. And uh, you know, way back they used to be offended by it. I think when they were less media savvy, uh, over time they sort of realized it was just words. Mm -hmm. um, and yes. Uh, Donald Trump has been as equally critical as anybody else. I think the Biden, I think it's interesting that the Biden comment, which you may recall that um, uh, Dave DeRoche sort of did a etymology of pariah and that it was particularly offensive uh, in, in Saudi Arabia and to the, to the crown prince. Um, but beyond that, I think the, the Saudis genuinely not happy with um, with Biden's behavior and and the, the support with Yemen, the response uh, to Houthi attacks, and any number of issues, but I wonder too if this isn't a little bit of a, a new situation where the Saudis are not so comfortable with just taking it on the cheek, you know, taking it on the chin every every campaign season, and then maybe if you know you you just shouldn't be you know if you're a candidate yeah okay you're going to speak to your domestic base and and say whatever but maybe you should show a little bit of discipline if you understand the relationship so i'm not saying that's the case i'm just saying it in 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 line with what we mentioned earlier about saudi showing more confidence feeling they're more of a global player and i think frankly but deserve greater attention from the, from the us on across a number of of topics maybe less patient with this sort of behavior during a campaign season. Maybe not, but you know, this is interesting that that this one really got them and really irritates them. Yeah, I mean in US elections, candidates just say whatever they want and it's, you know, and do kind of, and do. Yeah. And it's it's sort of uncomfortable for us as Americans to just admit that because it is frustrating. I think for both of us just as citizens of America that it's there's just you know during campaign seasons and we're we're in a midterm election year this year, you know, candidates will just say whatever they want. And usually about Saudi Arabia, it's easier to score a cheap political victory. I mean, right now it's about oil. 10 to 15 years ago, it was about security and terrorism. Terrorism, um, You know, and it just, it plays to a broader ignorance in the United States about Saudi Arabia. And that's part of what we're doing here, Richard, is we're trying to have a real conversation that is not 
you know, uh, based in hyperbole or, you know, is not just the top level, um, you know, analysis of what's going on between the United States and Saudi Arabia, but the actual stuff, uh, the G to G, the B to B, all that stuff going on between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. We're trying to just talk about it. And so it's it's interesting. I guess I don't have a, a point that I'm really making here. I just I'm well, quite cynical about those things. So, well, I agree with you. It is embarrassing. Our political discourse is so degraded. Mm -hmm. uh, going to the lowest common denominator, just dealing in grievance and and and, and mostly and in, in with no basis in fact, and it, it is embarrassing. And to be honest, the Saudis and, and other countries. There was a recent poll in Canada that that you know the Canadians are really worried about what's going on in Saudi Arabia. Why we can't communicate and the political discourse is so negative and so uh, unconstructive. Saudi Arabia, I think, feels the same way. Um, anybody's paying close attention, they're as worried about what's going on inside the U.S. as what we are, you know, attempting to or endeavoring to do in, in the foreign policy uh, environment. So it's a real concern, not only for us, but for globally. Yeah, we'll have to see what happens with the with the visit if it comes to pass. I don't know much about Biden's planned visit elsewhere in the Middle East or where he's going, um, but I mean, if I were president, I would visit Saudi Arabia. And I think that it's, you know, <laughs> yeah. you don't always, I mean, a little, maybe a little biased, maybe. Unless, but, um, you know, again, unless you put yourself in a hole by calling them pariah, which is just, yeah, we know. Right. And, and the absurdity of this is, is, and it's not, it's not that there aren't issues with Saudi Arabia. And I don't want to go on a rant here, but, um, and it's not anything you don't know, but, uh, you know, you have real issues with Saudi Arabia in terms of, of human rights and, and other deficiencies that we perceive. Um, but to call it, you know, but, you know, but to, the double standard is so striking for Saudis. I mean, if you're willing to meet with Recep Erdogan and Vladimir Putin and um, and Song Young, no, I'm sorry, the North head of North Korea, President Xi, um, and all of these people you know, Joe, Joe Biden would meet with. Mm -hmm. And you don't, you don't really come off looking well by saying, oh, look, we're not so bad because they're worse. And that's not the point I'm making the, the, because they all are worse than Saudi Arabia in terms of, of misbehavior and, and, and uh, human rights abuses. Um, so you, Saudi Arabia can't hide behind that. But their point is, if you're going to meet with them, is is hypocritical a double standard to be unwilling to meet with us? Mm -hmm. And when you're a head of state, you know, you say what you say to get elected, but then your job is to govern and to deal with the reality of the situation. The reality of the situation is that the U.S. and Saudi Arabia are strong allies below the surface, even if you don't like Saudi Arabia, even if you have a personal um, problem with Saudi Arabia. The reality is that your country has a lot of trade with Saudi Arabia. Oil prices are high now. So like Saudi Arabia controls, you know, not controls, but is the most important member in the OPEC plus cartel that includes Russia. I mean, it's just a complex world. So to have a very simple way of approaching it and say, look, we're just not going to deal with them. It's at do so at your own peril, in my opinion. Um, I want to I want to add one more thing while we're on this rant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we love and, rants and, here, by the way. This is a rant, rant friendly <laughs> podcast. <laughs> the, on the reporting about the Santa Fe and, and uh, Tehran Islands and other things, they refer to normalization of relationship with Israel. That is way too early. And mm -hmm. this, is, this is sort of Western media, um, uh, their hopes and their dreams. Um, you know, this is not what is in play here. You know, they are talking, hopefully they are talking, but when we get into it, we'll talk, see why they are talking. Um, a nor, you know, normalization of Israel and, and, so, and, and, and from the Israeli perspective, they love to hear that language. You know, Israel for years have always said, you know, we'll fly anywhere. We'll fly to Egypt. We'll fly to Saudi Arabia. Of course they will, mm -hmm. because it's just by active doing, it means they've been recognized. So they basically gain something by giving nothing. And this is where we are now. I mean, if, you know, Saudi Arabia and, and King Zalman in particular has said, you know, we have to have real movement on occupied territories and vis-a-vis the, yeah. -vis the Palestinians. And, and Israel is not willing to do this and they won't be doing this. Yeah. Um, so, you know, eventually some sort of uh, relationship will evolve and, and we'll, we'll see what it is. But this is not normalization of relations with Israel just yet.
that is the point that I'd like to make um, later when we discuss that specific is- issue in detail. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I, no, did it's I, all good. Did I step um, all over you? No, it's okay. Um, Richard, that's that's a really great point. We will get to that in a second. But first, let's get to our conversation with Chris Johnson. He speaks to us from his law firm in Riyadh. We have a great discussion with him on a, a slew of topics. So um, let's get to it. Excellent. Great to be back with Chris. It's our privilege to welcome back onto the 966, Mr. Chris Johnson, who is joining us from Riyadh. Chris is managing attorney and at the law firm Johnson & Pump in association with Al Sharif Law Firm. And he produces an absolutely fantastic weekly newsletter called Saudi Business Continuity Updates, which both Richard and I very much enjoy. This week, we'll be taking full advantage of our time with Chris to discuss Saudi Arabia's new data, uh, personal data privacy law, the kingdom's new investment law, and private sector participation program and how it fits into Vision 2030. Mr. Johnson, thank you so much for joining us once again on the 966 today. Always an honor and a pleasure. Well, it's our it's our honor and our pleasure. As I was saying, we the pace of change in Saudi Arabia is so brisk right now, and it's things new things coming up, new new legislation, changing regulatory environment. So we always look forward to to the opportunity to to sit with you, Chris, and 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 try and understand these things better. And you join a very hallowed group, a pantheon of of uh, the nine six six guests, uh, one of only two to be a repeat offender. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're really delighted you're here. And I want to make sure, Chris. Uh, I want to I want to echo what what Lucian said about that Saudi business continuity updates. They're really really good. I also want to make sure that we pay some attention to all the good work you're doing with AmCham KSA. You're um, you're deeply involved in a, 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 in a number of initiatives, I think, but in particular that diplomatic dialogue we can touch on later, and also that your know, public-private partnerships program, which is fascinating. But uh, let's lead off with uh, personal data privacy law, and just as context. In September 2021, Saudi Arabia issued its personal data protection law to regulate the processing of personal data. The PDPL, we'll call it, is the first federal data privacy legislation in Saudi Arabia and was to come into effect on March 23rd. However, day before the PDPL was to take effect on March 22nd, the Saudi Data and uh, Artificial Intelligence Authority delayed enforcement until March 17th, 2023, uh, after adding a one-year statutory statutory grace period, full enforcement has thus been delayed until March of 2024. Uh, Chris, this is uh, I, this is an interesting process. Uh, uh, clearly, they're trying to update and and bring into order their their privacy laws, and it looks like they got ahead of themselves. and And what's happening now with this? Um. Well, um, many of my clients were extremely worried that the new law would have required localization of their data in ways that would have made their market unprofitable and they would have had to close down their operations. I think that message got through that it had such a, uh, um, a broad brush to it and so little assurance that there would be exemptions as appropriate and some lack of sensitivity to the way that uh, we really do operate in a global environment and it's just not cost effective to replicate your enterprise software and your data hosting in each country in which you operate and so you know many of our clients in financial services and many other sectors um, were preparing contingency plans to close down their Saudi business. And so I think um, that realization is what um, prompted this rethink. So my own hope and guess is that not only will we have a postponement, we'll have a radical rewrite in which there's a more balanced, um, and you know, parts of the data privacy law are very good that um, this is, you know, we're always, uh, uh, pushing Saudi Arabia on the human rights front. Well, uh, privacy of individuals, that's an important human rights area. So uh, I'm glad they're focusing on that, though I also think there needs to be a balance between protection of individual um, uh, personal data versus uh, efficient uh, business services um, organized on a global basis. Yeah, some of the reporting it likened it to, to uh, as uh, the only as stringent as as one that uh, exists in China. Uh, in this in this is this period now that it's been postponed a little bit. Are they is SDAIA uh, 
asking for input? Is there a means to input? Is there a framework for, for the business community and others to, to express their concerns and maybe help redraft it? I think it's more a government to government thing. I think it's in response to pressures from embassies that this has been done. So most of the input opportunities, there are some laws and I'm not 100% sure whether it applies to any of the data privacy laws where they do solicit uh, stakeholder input. But uh, my observation is that it's taken seriously when a foreign government that's uh, an important trade partner weighs in like the US or the UK. Well, that's good. That's very good. So, so this is, and this is one of the, we're, we're putting you in a difficult spot because the first three topics we're talking about are hypotheticals in the sense that they, uh, they haven't come into play. So this PDPL obviously was intended to be in, 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 enacted on March 23rd, but it's been postponed. So we don't know how that's going to come out, but, but is this a, 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 an improved and elevated, I mean, was this a response to the initial draft and initial, initial personal data privacy law, it, was this in, in response to a need in terms of the Saudi market and in terms of making it uh, attractive to, to foreign, foreign investment? Or what, what was the genesis behind updating in, in this law, the PDPL? Well, uh, all over the world, um, there have been initiatives to um, uh, protect uh, data privacy in the context of scandals about leaks and breaches. And the European Union has really been the forerunner, and they have quite a, a severe uh, localization requirement that has um, been moderated somewhat in discussions with the U.S. and others. But I think Saudi Arabia felt inspired by what was happening elsewhere to also um, protect the data of their uh, citizens and residents um, and also to, uh, um, to uh, express their national sovereign pride in wanting to be a business center in which companies operate and, uh, and uh, uh, localize their activities, including their data. And that seems, I think that's a theme of a lot of the things we're going to be talking about. So um, another soon, you know, potentially enacted uh, bit of, uh, you know, let, you know, enacting some change in the regulatory environment. So uh, the Saudi Ministry of Investment announced on April 7th that it is drafting a new investment law that will provide for the equal treatment of local and foreign investors in respect of direct investments in the kingdom. Um, the law aims to support the principle of competitive neutrality and fairness and to ensure equal opportunities in the treatment of direct investments made by public and private investors. So this is, when something like this happens, Chris, you know, this is announced. Um, does that essentially uh, indicate that it's going to happen or, or do these things uh, get shelved later on? Or what, what do you think of this? Um, I think it expresses a genuine felt need by certain agencies, probably led by the Ministry of Investment, um, to um, demonstrate to foreign and global companies that Saudi Arabia is open for business in a very hospitable and uh, even-handed way. And uh, there's been a relative um, uh, shortage of uh, response to the privatization program, for example, and there's an assumption in Vision 2030, uh, there's certainly not enough government money to fund all the programs and all the um, initiatives for privatization that have been put forward. And so I think this is a signal to the international foreign investment uh, sources that Saudi Arabia takes their interests seriously and wants to be business and investor friendly. What does it mean if it were to be enacted? What, what does it mean on the ground practically? I mean, and, and does it, uh, does it, is it uh, an issue for uh, Saudi firms? Well, it will be, you know, if they have to compete on equal uh, playing field with uh, foreign investors, uh, you know, what will that mean practically? Well, I think it would mean that they would need to equalize their tax treatment. Uh, when Saudi Arabia joined the WTO in 2005, they were given a exemption on the national um, treatment uh, principle with respect to taxation. And so they were allowed to introduce a 20% um, uh, corporate income tax on foreigners while 
um, applying only the uh, zakat two and a half percent on net worth uh, um, Islamic tax on their citizens. I think you know that there's an example where there is no national treatment. So I think if they really are serious about uh, balancing um, uh, and providing equal uh, opportunity for foreign and local firms, they'll have to equalize the tax. That's one specific example, but uh, um, uh, there are many others as well. You know, they, they would have to, uh, I think, revisit their negative list of uh, sectors that are reserved for Saudi only. And they wouldn't take, uh, you know, I think they could still uh, uh, err on the side of national security in uh, uh, reserving certain areas that really do have a um, a security aspect for Saudi firms only, but you know things like trading. I think they would have to um, look at uh, allowing foreign firms to come in and compete in uh, retail and wholesale uh, with Saudi companies without having to uh, invest uh, thirty million rials over and and th- what is it three hundred million over five years, uh, uh, which is the uh, minimum required to. Uh, qualify for a hundred percent foreign owned trading license right now. And uh, had that negative list has it has it uh, decreased over the years? Is it still pretty pretty? What's on that negative list? Um, you know, certain things having to do with uh, you know uh, military uh, procurement and security guards and uh, uh, certain you know publications and. Uh, um, uh, they have loosened it up, you know, uh, ground transportation was on the list. It's been taken off. Um, uh, I think advertising is still on the list. Um, there, there's, uh, they've, uh, there, there has been some effective lobbying by the Ministry of Investment to remove more things from the list. And, um, so I'm hoping that they'll, they'll really do a radical revamp there. Uh, fascinating. And the, the, uh, the holy grail really is in, in these days is foreign investment. Uh, and, and well, there's many things that, are, you know, they have prioritized, but foreign investment trying to, to in, increase that and really, uh, you, you know, enhance it, get it deeper and stronger and wider is a, a major priority for them. And, and that infuses this uh, equal treatment potential, you know, uh, law, um, that's sort of the carrot. The Project HQ is a little bit of a stick. Um, and just for context, in January 2021, Saudi Arabia announced that international businesses without regional headquarters in Saudi Arabia may not be able to contract with agencies, institutions, and fund owned by the Saudi government, effective January 1, 2024. Um is this, I know you're doing a diplomatic dialogue with uh, AmCham USA, and you hosted one recently. Uh, is this one of the things that is part of that, that discussion, the diplomatic dialogue, the, the, the HQ project, the Project HQ? That was the subject of our latest uh, event that Neil Crompton, the British ambassador, hosted at his residence. We had Chow Ming Chow, the Singapore ambassador, and we had uh, Martina Strong, the U.S. Charge d'Affaires on, on the panel. And that was the topic. We, we called it uh, building business hubs. And uh, so we tried to uh, present some case studies from those three countries, the U.S., the U.K., and Singapore, of what has worked and how to go about encouraging companies. And we tried to give it a spin that the carrot is much more effective than the stick. The stick is, uh, scares people, and it, uh, it sounds like um, uh, coercion. And so uh, uh, what we tried to do in a very indirect and diplomatic way is to say that if your goal is to build a business hub in King Abdullah Financial District, you're going to have a lot more success if you um, uh, try to uh, compete on positive terms rather than on threats. And uh, so that was sort of our, um, our uh, approach. And um, I think we got a pretty positive response. And I think that there are a lot of uh, sensible um, uh, voices within the government that are, uh, you know, that are appreciative that uh, they have to make it attractive. It's not enough to say that you'll be um, uh, deprived of opportunity if you don't do it. And what does attractive mean? 
I mean, is that is that a tax thing? Is that a is that a school thing? Is that a quality of life thing? Well, it's I think it's primarily an ease of business thing. It's that you're going to come in here and you're going to encounter a regulatory system that is no less um, problematic and aggressive and uh, adversarial. Um, that it's no more problematic than what you are familiar with and what uh, the other competitors for this uh, global capital are offering. And so, uh, you know, I think um, my advice to the, um, to the government would be, you know, look at where the problems are, the perceived problems. Uh, and, uh, you know, the U.S. Embassy and others have been quite clear in identifying areas of concern to their uh, um, stakeholders in their own business communities. You know, and one is that the uh, Saudiization uh, quotas are in many cases, uh, you know, very pro custian and very um, uh, aggressive and uh, difficult uh, to achieve, you know. And so there you need to be a little more um, uh, flexible in terms, you know, similar to what um, the US or Singapore do where, um, you do give preference to Saudi candidates, but if there are none who are qualified, you're given an easier road to bringing in people who are from your own uh, business world. And um, uh, and also there've been a lot of tax issues where the um, ZATCA, the tax department uh, has been uh, not very transparent or predictable and sometimes uh, perceived to be arbitrary and imposing big retroactive assessments um, uh, in ways that have really been very uh, uh, problematic for a lot of foreign investors. Uh, and uh, so, um, you know, and I think there are other areas. The uh, um, system for legalizing documents abroad is extremely cumbersome. Uh, Saudi Arabia nominally assigned the uh, Hague Convention on Apostille, but Apostille does not work here. You have to go the old um, um, traditional way of uh, notarizing and going through all the hoops right through uh, consularization at a Saudi embassy. And this can take six months now in the U.S. And so that's a huge uh, wet blanket on getting businesses up and running. If you need to have fully legalized uh, powers of attorney and corporate resolutions and constitutional documents, and these have to go through the U.S. Department of State and the state uh, Department of State and the uh, and the Saudi consulate. Uh, that this is extremely cumbersome. Then it comes here and it has to go to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Interior. The whole process can can uh, delay your um, incorporation by six or eight months. So, as a point of reference, the sort of benchmark here is the Emirates. How long does it take to do that in the Emirates? I think they're. Um, um, I think they're, they're much more efficient. I haven't heard the complaints from there, but that, that's, that's not my field. Right. You know, the Saudiization and Nitakat, the, that whole process that began, I think, back in 2011 has been a fascinating journey, uh, you know, uh, forward, backwards, uh, adapt, change, redirect. Is, and, you know, that's a particular, at that level, to say, so if you're a foreign firm and you're going, all right, we need to meet these quotas, uh, and we're, we're going to make this job available, but there are no uh, appropriate Saudi candidates. You know, is, that's a hard one to, to monitor. You know? uh, they did have a system for a while where you could um, send, your, uh, uh, send your, um, your needs to the Ministry of Human Resources. And uh, uh, they had uh, a web page where candidates could apply and you could um, either... Um, uh, hire those candidates, or you could give reasons why they didn't meet your specifications, and then they, then you would be allowed to get a visa block. Um, uh, so that's, in some ways, the first step towards what Singapore and the U.S. do. And, uh, um, but, you know, in many fields, there's no real understanding of the rationale behind this. In my field, for example, in the legal field, uh, our quota for Saudiization is 50% among our professionals. So the lawyers 
uh, we have to have 50%. And in my business, I serve foreign clients. Um, that's our niche. And, uh, and um, so, you know, we are sort of uh, uh, heavily weighted towards American and European and other um, uh, foreign jurisdictions because that's where our clients come from. So we have to arbitrarily um, recruit 50% of our staff. Well, that's more than we need in terms of our particular business uh, profile. And, uh, and now that's going up to 70% in August. And I, I don't know how we'll do that. You know, it'll sort of ruin our business plan. And uh, so, but there's no real avenue to have a discussion about this. So th- th- that, that is very problematic in a lot of sectors. And what are the fines involved if you can't meet that number? Well, it's not a fine that close you down. Your, your business services are suspended and you can no longer uh, get visas and uh, your bank accounts will be closed. Uh, you know, you have to be in compliance if you want your government services to be uh, maintained. Uh, how frequently is that happening? Well, it does happen to a lot of our clients, you know, when they unexpectedly, uh, because of um, unplanned uh, attrition, uh, um, uh, they have their services closed down and then they call us and we go into full gear to help them get, get it fixed. On that tax assessment, surprise tax assessment, are we talking the Uber Kareem uh, or there are more examples of that? Oh, there are many examples. I'd say... Um, uh, I, I, it's not half, but maybe a quarter or a third of my foreign clients have serious tax problems right now. And is that a matter of uh, uh, unforeseen assessments or uh, just difficult uh, regulations to, to adhere to? Well, it's what I see is uh, overreaching interpretations of their statute where uh, they're, uh, they seem to be... Um, um, uh, looking for ways to enhance revenue and in, uh, in, in, uh, by interpreting uh, ambiguities to their benefits. And, and, but uh, to their credit, you know, they do have a uh, mediation committee and we have had some good results by taking some of these issues there. When, uh, when the HQ, uh, Project HQ was announced, uh, one of the things, you know, they, they noted that 44 multinational companies, including PepsiCo, Baker Hughes, Halliburton, Phillips, Schlumberger, and Novartis, have relocated their regional headquarters to the kingdom. Um, is, I was talking with uh, uh, a consultant just the other day, and he was saying one of the things might do is it, it might actually lead to more M&A where a, a large multinational will will uh, acquire a Saudi counterpart in Saudi Arabia and designate that as their, you know, a headquarters, you know? So in other words, it, it's, it's, it, it's, 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 uh, is that, is that eligible? Is that adequate to do this? Or is that, is that something you might be seeing? Um, well, a, uh, to qualify as a regional headquarters, it cannot be a commercial entity. It has to be a support entity. So if you were to acquire a business that has clients and that has revenues, that would not satisfy the requirement. And so um, it's more akin to a technical and scientific office that has a support role for its uh, corporate um, um, group, for its um, uh, sister companies. Um, so uh, uh, it's... Uh, I think that it would not satisfy that requirement if you were to acquire an ongoing business. And just to clarify, this this affects uh, companies seeking government tenders, government contracts, not private sector. So, so we're basically eighteen months away from when this is enacted. Are you seeing movement, Chris? Oh yeah, yeah. There, I have one client. I, I don't want to name names, but uh, that has. Um, already been licensed and is up and running uh, as a regional headquarters. So, and that's an example. I mean, so, so it's, it's, uh, as we said, it's a stick and you, you, your diplomatic dialogue suggests maybe carrots would be better, but it, it, it is inducing some of that change they're hoping to see. It's focused a lot of companies that have that are dependent on the government as their clients to really uh, come up with plans on how to satisfy that requirement. Yep. Yeah, I, they seem to feel uh, you know it will bring a lot of investment, a lot of capital into Riyadh, 
and uh, be part of their what you know their refashioning of Riyadh and growth of Riyadh. Um, fascinating. Uh, so that's two sort of things in process. Three actually: the the PDPL, the the new business law, you know, seeing equity between foreign and domestic firms, and now this HQ process. Um, can we talk a little bit, Chris, about uh, the private sector participation uh, initiative that you're doing with AmCham KSA? And and just to give me, uh, this is you. I'll let you run with this because, and you can, and, and if you would, if you can give it a context of why it's so important in terms of their vision 2030 and why AmCham KSA decided to really focus on it, but. Um, I guess for the next six months, AmCham KSA is organizing six conferences and roundtables where all players involved in the Saudi privatization program will take the stage to re- introduce their projects. And I won't go any further into that, but can you tell us a little bit about what, what you're doing with this program? Yeah, um, it's been slow in a birthing. You know, it's been promised uh, with Vision 2030 for um, however many years, uh, five or six years. Uh, there's been a lot of um, delay as they fine tune their new regulations and uh, roll out their uh, um, uh, their uh, privatization laws, but they are now out since March, and uh, so the time has come, and uh, they're getting very organized. I think they've identified 17 sectors, and they've set up committees. Um, to monitor and simplify and streamline the approval process so that they won't require um, council of ministers uh, approval of each new project it can be done on an expedited basis and uh, I think they've identified 20 projects that they want to conclude by the end of the year and another 20 or more for next year and uh, I think they're absolutely serious. They've set up a national infrastructure fund that will help with the finance that's teamed with BlackRock and um, will help to accelerate the implementation of this project. They seem to be quite flexible on structure and also on choice of law, which is very reassuring to foreign investors. So there's a lot to like in this program. And I think they're... uh, planning to sort of follow the model of what you saw in the UK in the 80s and 90s, where a lot of uh, nationalized companies in uh, transportation and medicine and healthcare and uh, a wide range of sectors were, were privatized, and they plan to go much further than that. And they looked at models in Australia and Canada that are still very active in privatizing, um, and they're trying to... Uh, radically transform their economy. And so I'm expecting there will be a seismic shift in the next five, 10 years, and you'll see a totally different landscape. Can you help me a little bit with, with um, vocabulary? Uh, private sector, so privatization, uh, privatization and public-private partnerships. Uh, are they the same thing? I mean, I, I think of privatization, you know, the, the aviation, recent aviation summit, they, they, they're trying to, to, to privatize 29 airports eventually. Uh, these independent water and power projects that they're, they're uh, inviting people to bid on. I mean, are these, can you, can you help us understand, is there a distinction? What are we talking about here? I think the goal ideally will be to put all these assets in private hands. And uh, there may be some exceptions where the government continues to retain a shareholding, but I think the overall objective is to shift the operating element of lots of, uh, as I say, 17 uh, different categories that include uh, healthcare, hospitals, uh, uh, education, schools, um, you know, uh, as you say, a lot of logistical uh, facilities, airports, seaports, um, you know, I, I'm thinking uh, roads, uh, you know, I think it'll be extremely broad. And um, uh, in what sense is it a public-private partnership? Well, um, the uh, public has hitherto been the owner and the operator, and the private has been the constructor, the construction contractor under the procurement regulations. Well, this will change. The uh, private investors will become the owners and the operators, and the government role will be um, radically shifted from being the owner-operator to being the regulator. So there's going to be a 
different uh, mentality and a different responsibility. And uh, I think uh, both sides will have to totally rethink uh, um, what they do and who they are. I think one of the questions that we had last night that I thought was very good was, you know, what does it take to make a success of this um, retooling of the relationship? It'll take a lot of forbearance and trust on both sides. And so there needs to be, a, and so there the word partnership becomes key. And if you look at the US, there are a lot of regulatory relationships that are not partnerships. They're very adversarial. If you look at the IRS or the INS for getting um, residency, or um, if you look at the SEC, uh, it's like a, a police function. And so I think there was you know, one theme that, uh, resonated, I think, on both the private and the public side of my panel is that we want to have trust and relationship and partnership between the regulator and the investor. And so uh, uh, if they achieve that, God bless them. That's, uh, that'll be huge in terms of encouraging uh, investment, both domestic and foreign. Well, it's interesting that AmCham KSA has, has made it such a marquee issue for them that you know they want to position themselves as a as a you know a champion of this process and a, and a, and I think as you pointed as it's, it's a bridge between a, a public and private sectors so it's clearly a, an important issue for the AmCham KSA as well. Well, we had 150 people sign up. We were sold out, and there was huge interest. In- <laughs> and this is was this the first of six? Yes, yes. And. Yeah. The- they're going to be, you're going to take place all around. You're going to take a place in Jeddah, Riyadh in the Eastern province. You're going to, uh, it's going to be around the kingdom. Yes. Yes, it will be. And, uh, and, you know, we, uh, we got the top people from the key agencies from, uh, you know, the national center for privatization and the, uh, um, the national infrastructure fund and, uh, and uh, people from uh, uh, you know, major companies, including Jacobs from the U S was on my panel and um, I think they're, uh, you know, uh, American companies uh, need to look at this very seriously. And that's our opinion at the AmCham that this is for real and that there are going to be serious opportunities that you'll neglect at your peril. There's certainly a lot of interest from Korea and China and, uh, and Europe. Uh, the U.S. has been a little slow, but I think that we're the natural partners. I think there's a cultural affinity between Saudi Arabia and the U.S. that you don't see with Asia or elsewhere to the same degree. And uh, I think uh, other things being equal, Saudi companies prefer to work with American uh, because they know the culture and they trust the uh, quality and the uh, integrity. How large is the AmCham KSA these days? We have 400 some uh, members. Um, and so that's a mix of individuals and corporate, but I think we're several hundred corporate and uh, lots of individuals who join in their personal capacities. You have, a, you have an un, uh, unparalleled understanding of the trajectory and arc of the uh, chamber, the chambers of commerce over the AmCham uh, KSA, that number 400, how, how does that compare to previous highs or lows? We're down the, um, uh, you know, the COVID was devastating for all networking organizations, particularly ours. We live and die on big um, networking events like we right. had last and uh, during COVID, that was impossible. And so, uh, you know, who's, uh, what's the value of uh, joining an organization that's operating online and virtually and the video conference? That's just not the way the world works in the Middle East. You know, it's face-to-face or nothing. You've said that before, and you said that's, that's a very meaningful context in building any kind of relationship. Well, and the Arabs, I have to hand it to them. They're very relationship oriented. To me, that uh, that's a good thing. Um, that they're very uh, skillful at, uh, at developing and maintaining relationships of trust and uh, you know mutual benefit. And uh, um, uh, you know, I, I often say that uh, sometimes. Uh, the American South, whether it's Texas or Alabama or Georgia, that they have a great advantage here because that's true in the South as well. That uh, you know, unlike New York, which is you know, what have you done for me recently and uh, transactionally oriented, uh, the South is relationship oriented. Well, that's uh, a natural for succeeding in this environment. 
Fascinating. Now, um, uh, I wanted to, I, I added just this morning, and you kindly agreed. <laughs> I said, and what part of the reason I did this, you know, in your, in your updates, uh, Saudi continuity updates, uh, occasionally you wax poetic, which I, I, I really enjoy. <laughs> you talk about your personal, uh, you know, perspective on things. So in a recent one, and, and the, the lead was Saudi corruption and, you know, in retreat, question mark. And this is what you wrote. Uh, unlike such moral reprobates as Kazakhstan, Russia, Belarus, Venezuela, Iran, and similarly inclined havens in Africa, Asia, and beyond, Saudi Arabia has in many ways planted its flag among the angels. Consistent with an unambiguous Sharia prohibition, the Prophet Muhammad clearly and broadly condemned, condemned quote, briber, comma, bribe and facilitator, unquote, alike. Uh, corruption has been targeted as a serious problem. And then you go on to to offer a chronology. Uh, so anyway, I mean, again, like I said, I li- I really like it when you when you uh, when you <laughs> you you go eloquent like that. Um, what is the state of of, of uh, you know corruption? You know, we we read about and hear about Nizaha, and it, it appears to be that that's a that's an active and and independent uh, agency that is out there. Uh, doing good in terms of uh, fighting corruption, but what's the current situation? What's your assessment currently? Um, well, they are certainly very visible. You know, we get uh, texts on our cell phones all the time saying, if you see anything improper, let us know and we'll take it from there. And I think they are. And I've had some uh, uh, clients who have had brushes with the Nazaha. I think they're serious and I think they're uh, uh, very proactive, and uh, it's a positive development overall. Uh, um, and uh, I think that uh, it's uh, timely in the t- context of what we're seeing in the uh, Russia-Ukraine context. Um, that's focused attention on ways in which um, there's been a lot of corruption in uh, some of the some of the countries uh, on the Russian side of the, of the former Soviet Union, and how we've been very accommodating of their. Um, uh, desires to recycle national money through personal hands into real estate in London and New York and Miami and the like. And so I think it's a climate where um, increasingly there will be attention focused, you know, just like on the human rights side, the countries get in trouble when they uh, play fast and loose with um, uh, human rights. Um, I think you're going to see it more and more on the kleptocracy side. And so uh, you know, uh, God willing, um, um, this campaign will uh, take note of uh, trends elsewhere and will align. And, you know, and as a, uh, a, a recent head of the G20 and uh, having participated in some of these um, initiatives to, uh, you know, adopt better practices and ESG and a wide range of other sort of cutting edge um, improvements and uh, corporate and business culture. I hope that uh, that sinks in deep uh, in terms of uh, anti-corruption as well. Well, it seems uh, the PAF, the Public Investment Fund, is involved in so many aspects of the economy, and and I have heard discussion that you know their uh, their attention to detail and and to international standards and you know hewing to international standards is. Uh, is a big influence. I mean, it's it's it sort of uh, sets a benchmark and uh, and how the, how all business is to be handled and uh, is a good in essence and a, a good um, good model. Is that accurate? I think so. The head of um, uh, the, the chief uh, uh, governance compliance officer is a Canadian woman who's a friend of mine, and she's very. Uh, uh, knowledgeable and seems quite confident that she has the ear of the top people in terms of uh, of uh, nurturing and inculcating some of the best practices globally into the PIF approach. So I think the answer is uh, um, uh, I'm very encouraged by what I see in here. So uh, so we'll go with that that uh, lovely paragraph that you wrote. Uh, we'll go with the things are progressing in the right direction in terms of corruption. I think there's a lot to be said in the kingdom's um, favor in terms of their anti-corruption commitment. I think um, uh, 
the news is generally good. Yeah. Uh, now, so since you mentioned Ukraine, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it, it, politically and, you know, it, it, we'll, we'll ask you to go up a little bit. Uh, you know, the, the the response from Saudi Arabia and the UAE and, and many, many, many emerging markets uh, in the in the across the globe to the U.S. call, U.S.-EU call for solidarity in terms of um, uh, their position on the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the rather tepid response. Uh, what's your what's your take on this? Yeah, my take is that um, Russia has um, uh, fundamentally violated the um, essential uh, rules that um, uh, were uh, developed after World War II in terms of uh, how do we avoid similar catastrophes to what we've just been through ever happening again. And uh, one of the core principles was inviolability of borders. And so that's kind of a red line and the Russians crossed that. And that should be obvious to everybody, including in this region, that this is a serious problem that cannot be ignored. I would love to have seen a more proactive and responsive um, uh, indication of understanding that this uh, is the type of behavior that threatens everybody, particularly in this region, being close as they are to the uh, to, to Russia, and it commands a more proactive and uh, and clear-cut response in terms of standing up to that kind of armed aggression. So I'm uh, still hoping that there'll be a change of heart and that we'll see a more a supportive approach. And we have seen that in the UAE. The UAE, when they were approached by the Ukrainian uh, embassy um, and asked for humanitarian aid, it was delivered within a week. Um, so, um, you know, I think there's a sort of divided opinion in this region, but I think the UAE called it right. And I'd love to see the Saudis get on board. And I guess the Saudis sent a small amount of humanitarian aid too. Yeah, it's a, it's a diplomatic... Um challenge, I think, for, for these Gulf states, Saudi Arabia and UAE in particular, because of their relationship uh, through the OPEC plus with Russia. And, and I think there's a, there's a, you know, the, the, it's not a notion, but the, the idea of a rule-based international order is attractive. And as you say, I think is especially important to, to states in that region that it be uh, abided by um, but yes, the, the we talked with uh, John Alterman recently, who who introduced the 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 term hedging bef- just before the uh, Russia Russia invaded Ukraine, and and hedging is what the Gulf states are doing largely. Well, hedging is good, but um, you need to be discerning about your hedges, and you don't want to hedge with a um, with with a um, uh, with a bully. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well said. <laughs> uh, yeah, Lucian, uh, uh, jump in. I, I, I you uh, know, I, I think you've got it. I couldn't possibly jump in and uh, <laughs> uh, sully this awesome conversation. Well, uh, Chris, uh, again, you know, it's when we talk about changes and things that are going to go in Saudi Arabia. There's just many, and it's a it's a bit of a fire hose in terms of these things. And uh, so we picked four issues that we wanted to bring up with you. Are there, are there issues uh, that are coming across your desk every day that in terms of business and, and, and in particular in terms of U.S. companies being successful in Saudi Arabia that we may have overlooked? Um, you know, American companies have been gun shy about coming in. We do get some, but uh, the big investments um, are missing. And what we do see is related to the Giga project. So it's all responding to procurement needs. But in terms of um, coming in, you know, proactively and strongly, I, I'd say there still is some human rights um, uh, concerns. And so you do have some examples of. Um, both individuals and companies that are um, uh, in line with uh, some of the Democratic uh, congressmen in terms of uh, uh, redlining Saudi Arabia for human rights uh, concerns. Uh, And, um, you know, I think the kingdom uh, has taken that to heart. And, um, you know, I I think that what happened in 
um, Istanbul has not been repeated. I think that's uh, to their credit. Uh, and so um, at some point, I think, um, you know, assuming that there are no more incidents of that nature, there needs to be a willingness to balance that unfortunate incident with the reality that we still need each other for many reasons and that the basis of our relationship based on our uh, unique ability to provide security and uh, the other uh, things that they like about us, of which there are many, our educational system, our culture, um, you know, many of their uh, social and cultural reforms are uh, in many ways inspired by what we have in the U.S., their uh, entertainment initiatives and uh, uh, Riyadh Street and other uh, similar things uh, feature American artists. There's clearly a, uh, an emotional affinity. They watch American films. Uh, English is the language of the, uh, of the business world and beyond. Um, you know, uh, uh, in the bigger picture, both Saudi Arabia and the U.S. need each other. Um, when um, you know we came to the rescue of uh, the kingdom threatened by Saddam Hussein in 1990, that was extremely consequential. Now, you know, uh, um, we would like to see a similar reciprocal response to what we see as an existential threat from what, what Russia is doing on the threshold of Europe, um, and. Um, you know, all of these things um, uh, are being weighed in the balance, not only by our government, but also by our companies. And I think Saudi Arabia um, um, would like to be closer to the U.S. There are rumors of a Biden presidential visit to Saudi Arabia. I hope that happens, and I hope that it uh, succeeds in uh, reopening some doors that seem to be uh, uh, closing. Oh, fascinating. A couple of questions, Chris. Um, you know, in terms of the, the Gulf War and, and the U.S. coming uh, uh, to assist and participate in removing Saddam Hussein from Kuwait, you know, the, uh, that seems to be replaced by a, a more recent uh, sentiment, you know, that uh, a sense of uh, being let down after by the UAE and the Saudis and, and Saudi Arabia being let down by their responses to attacks on their homeland, both in the Emirates and the Saudi Arabia. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, I wonder if that one, that, that, that sentiment prevails more than others. But this, the, the second question, uh, and you referenced, uh, you referenced uh, Jamal Khashoggi and you referenced human rights. When a U.S. corporate comes in and is looking at possibly, you know, investing, becoming more involved in Saudi Arabia, are they taking these things in? Is that is that a factor in their decision? Are they concerned, for example, about uh, detentions or or the Khashoggi uh, murder? Because um, are those you know are those weighty considerations for them? If they come from California, yes, and sometimes beyond. But you know the uh, trends in the U.S. and the business world are towards giving greater. Um, uh, latitude to stakeholders, investors, uh, and private equity funds uh, um, in uh, determining policies, and that uh, you know there's a debate that's been ongoing for decades about what are the responsibilities of corporate directors and officers. Uh, it's, um, as Milton Friedman said, uh, singularly focused on profitability, or does it extend beyond that to the environmental, social, governmental uh, governance concerns and, um, you know, being a good steward of the uh, public um, environment and, the, uh, uh, and uh, this sort of a thing. And so I'd say that um, there's a trend that does extend into the human rights area, um, uh, that public corporations are influenced by. And uh, so there is a uh, evaluation, you know, they uh, want their money to be ethically invested. And uh, so they, uh, you know, there is a greater weight given at the corporate decision-making level to does this country meet our standards in terms of where we'd like to, uh, to, to put our trust and put our shareholders' money. And so you're you're essentially talking about boards of directors and and and, and who are sensitive to the larger issue uh, and and perhaps 
uh, public relations at home. That's interesting. So California uh, is notably more sensitive to this uh, than than. Uh, <laughs> is that correct? Do I read you right? Well, if you if you follow the press and see the companies that have withdrawn from Saudi Arabia, they're largely from Hollywood or San Francisco or Silicon Valley. Right, and that's that's, that's an aftermath of of twenty eighteen, but. Yeah, I just it just seems to me currently, especially with the growth and some of the things that are going on in Saudi Arabia and, and the, the attractiveness of the market. I mean, the, the top concerns would be some of the things you laid out, the, the, you know, the quotas, the tax, the, the documentation, you know, delays, that sort of thing. And it's interesting that to, uh, to hear you say that there are still, uh, I guess, political risk or, or reputational issues. Um, for a company coming in, which, you know, you see it firsthand. So that's, that's uh, interesting. Well, you know, and um, as we've been sort of reminded by some of the abuses of power in uh, uh, Russia under Putin, where he's been able to unilaterally and without any real accountability or input from his advisors, seemingly has been able to take the country down some very problematic paths um, you know, that sort of uh, what you see in Ukraine is reminiscent of what you saw in Europe in 1938, 1939, where, uh, you know, Germany also had some very um, uh, uh, elaborate theories about why they had been provoked by Poland and by Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia and France and others. And in their minds, they were the victims. And uh, so they created this alternate reality. And, uh, um, and, uh, you know, it's uh, been an interesting study, you know, what is similar in Russia today and, uh, to what happened in Germany in the 30s. And there's a really interesting theorist, uh, his name is Ernst Frankel, who was a, a Jewish lawyer in the 30s in Germany, who got out just in time in 1938 and landed in Chicago, uh, where he was hired by the University of Chicago and he wrote a book called The Dual State and he uh, talked about what happened in March of 1933 when Hitler was given dictatorial powers and he called it the dual state and he talked about the normative state that uh, operated independently of the executive uh, and that was predictable and that was fair-handed and you could um, count on a even-handed uh, justice and so that uh, created an environment where people invested and where the country became very prosperous and attracted a lot of uh, trust and investment and Germany became the industrial powerhouse of the world under the normative state. But then as of March of two, uh, 1933, um, we saw a new parallel uh, entity that he called uh, the prerogative state. And the prerogative state had jurisdiction over jurisdiction. It was able to suspend the operation of uh, the normative state at its uh, sole discretion and sole unaccountable discretion, and Hitler abused that terribly. And that's really politically, uh, according to Ernst Frankel, the uh, origin of World War II. And I think you can see something similar in terms of the origin of the Ukraine invasion. And uh, so to the extent that uh, other countries in the world uh, have a prerogative state that can arbitrarily suspend the operations of the normative state. It's sort of a formula for disquiet among American investors, I would say. Well, it's uh, ironic, it's not the term, but um, that the parallel you just talked about with regard to Vladimir Putin, you know, is particularly striking when he, he talks about going into Ukraine to, to fight Nazis, Nazi sympathizers, uh, you know, and when in, what you're saying is, is very much the reverse. Um, Chris, uh, thank you very much. I, uh, we, we really appreciate your taking time and it's nice to, we, we, we've, we've had uh, the, the, our first episode with you. We had you in your home. Uh, this one, we have you in your office. Our next one, uh, maybe somewhere out in the desert. You're, you're welcome anytime, both of you. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Johnson, um, thank you so much. Joining us from Riyadh, managing attorney at the law firm Johnson & Pump in association with Al-Sharif Law Firm. Great conversation. Thank you, Chris. Thank you both for including me again, for making me a, a, a second-time uh, 
Yes, and, and may there be many more. Repeat offender is what Richard said. <laughs> yes, you know, you know, Lucian, we need to we need to get some complimentary mugs so we can give them to our special guests. <laughs> That was our conversation with Mr. Chris Johnson. We thank him so much for his time. Again, reminder, you can watch all these things, his segments on YouTube. Uh, so if you want to just listen to our conversation with him, do so there. We really appreciate it. Uh, Richard, what do you think? Shall we get to Yella? Yes, let's get to Yella. And that was a great conversation with Chris. He's a real practitioner at the ground level, and, and it's nice of him to share his expertise with us. Always a treat. Always mm -hmm. informative. Yella. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, we said Yella. Yeah. <laughs> Yellow. Yellow. <laughs> Saudi in a minute. Saudi in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> All right. so one, Saudi official rules out changing laws to introduce alcohol. Asked in a panel session about Saudi Arabia at the World Economic Forum on the possibility of offering alcohol in its new destinations such as Neom, Assistant Minister of Tourism, Princess Haifa bint Mohammed said, quote, Saudi Arabia has been very transparent on where it stands on everything. We were very clear, and we even heard it from our head of state on where we stood on serving alcohol, unquote. Uh, let's go back. Let's just continue that quote. Uh, the short answer is that we're going to continue with our current laws, unquote. She pointed out that the kingdom is, quote, doing very well when it comes to attracting tourists and opening the country for visitors from around the world. Uh, and finally, she added, we have been outperforming globally in tourism with what we currently have to offer today. There's a lot to go around without introducing anything new, unquote. Yeah, there's a lot that's interesting in this answer from Princess Haifa. First, she uses the term head of state here instead of mentioning uh, King Salman by name. We could put our Kremlinology hats on and parse the meaning there, but <laughs> that, that phrasing is very interesting. Um, second, she says uh, in her answer, she says the short answer is that we're going to continue with our current laws. So there's a longer answer that may or may not uh, have a little bit more complexity to it in this. I don't think there's an upside, Richard, at all of announcing a decision right now to allow alcohol or not before these resorts and destinations are fully open. I mean, why do that? It only invites criticism, speculation, blowback, and maybe there isn't a plan either way in place. Um, in my opinion, I think... Um, and in the opinion of virtually everyone that I have talked to about visiting Saudi Arabia, hypothetically, I think it, I think for Saudi tourism, at least for resorts to really work, to really reach its full potential of attracting visitors, you got to figure out a way to serve alcohol. And that's my opinion. That isn't the opinion of anybody you know else. But we've talked about this before, Richard. Saudi Arabia doesn't want to be Las Vegas, but like it or not, tourists will choose to visit a similar place either in the region like Dubai or around the world where alcohol is served. Um, and it's you know, not just the party tourism, senior frogs cl uh, crowd. <laughs> Some of these are extremely high end resorts aiming to attract big dollars from big spenders. Those folks are going to want to drink a little bit of wine with their $80 steak. So um, Saudi Arabia is going to do what it's going to do. And if I had to guess, I would bet they eventually find a way to allow it somehow. But again, I, you know, I don't know that for sure. But tourists have choices on where they go and they will lose a lot of them by not offering what other places offer. That's an interesting point, and and uh, I, I and I'm not sure where they land, but I absolutely agree with you. There's no point in, in announcing anything at this point. Um, you know, they hit 62 million visits visitors this year, and they're on their way to 100 million. Obviously, most of those, the vast majority of those, were domestic. Um, but you wonder too, on the flip side, of that as a, as a devil's advocate, is maybe if they're they're discovering that the things they're offering, which are essentially cultural tourism or adventure tourism um, might be sufficient to, uh, to attract, uh, you know, the numbers that they want. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, 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 it'll be interesting where this ends up. I also think it's interesting that she sort of slapped this down. Uh, you may recall that uh, the, recently um, the um, tourism sector head for NEOM suggested that neon was going to have its own special status and you know distinguish it distinguish it from others that was slapped down mm -hmm. uh you've got you know you had a basically essentially someone saying uh from the government saying that, that uh, neon will be completely under saudi arabia's sovereignty and regulations now that doesn't it's like it's a little bit of there's wiggle room in there you know those saudi and regulations but 
you mm-hmm. know, they're keeping a, a, a firm hand on things at the moment. And I think they have to, because as we've talked about before, they have they have domestic constituencies. They have very significant conservative constituencies that they need to be sensitive to and they need to be responsive to. Um, so like you say, and I think you put your finger on it, there's no point in getting out ahead of this. You know, if at some point in these hyper luxury areas, luxury resorts or luxury resorts, if you can have alcohol in the hotel, which, which you know, the Emirates did for many years and, and does, uh, maybe you do that, but no hurry to get there, especially when you're, when you're just straight tourism numbers are, are improving and really going up, going up strong. Yeah, the time to make a decision is not now. And, you know, they're going to they're not going to be pressured one way or, or, or another on this. They're going to, you know, do what they want to do. I think that market pressures at some point, I mean, they're really their tourism sector is in a great spot right now. And as you mentioned, and as uh, Princess Haifa mentioned in her comments, one of the top globally uh, in terms of rebounding after the pandemic. Why? Because many people are vaccinated. They were really good about that. They're pandemic um, restrictions and all the efforts to mitigate the pandemic in Saudi Arabia really worked, which we've discussed about a lot on the show. And also, um, you know, the economy is starting to hum again. Uh, Oil prices are up. People are visiting Saudi Arabia. But again, like a lot of these resort destinations that are planned are not done. Neom is just getting started and being built. The Red Sea um, will be open in a year or two. So no rush to make a decision now. So I thought her answer was very good. And Again, this is not it's it's uh, frankly, it's the type of thing with when they announce it, they'll make some announcement and we'll say, yeah, I knew it. But I mean, you know, in the moment, you know, we'll say we knew that they were kind of hedging, you know, delaying a little bit, but they may not do that. They may say, look, we don't really want that here. And, you know, our culture is different. If you want to visit a place that's actually different, this is different. There is no alcohol. If you can still have fun without it, then come visit. But it's interesting. Um, I, I get this question a lot. I mean, this is something Americans know about Saudi Arabia. So, you know, <laughs> you know, it may not be if it may not be the spot if you want to go. You know, the sun on the beach in Margarita, have a margarita. But uh, again, it, that's it's off to the future. No reason to answer it. They're doing pretty well otherwise. And and mm-hmm. like you say, you know, the hyper luxury stuff and the luxury resorts aren't in place yet. Right. Right. Yella number two, the U.S. is negotiating a deal among Saudis and Israelis and Egyptians um, over the transfer of two islands. The Biden administration has been quietly mediating among Saudi Arabia, Israel and Egypt on negotiations to finalize the transfer of two strategic islands in the Red Sea from Egyptian control to Saudi sovereignty. Five U.S. and Israeli sources told Axios, which we sidebar has been on fire recently with the exclusive reporting. (laughs) In an, if an arrangement is reached, it would be a significant foreign policy achievement for the Biden administration in the Middle East. Richard, we talked a little bit about this earlier. We can now get into it, sink our teeth into it now. <laughs> well, it's an interesting story, and that's why it, it, it has, a, it has a, a logic of its own. And that's why I don't think, you know, the, the reference to normalization applies here. I mean, it, the, the fact that they're, they're talking, okay, that's fine. And, but there's a specific reason and need for the Israelis and the, and the Egyptians and the Saudis to all be in the same room talking about this topic. And, and for background, I know, Lucian, you did some research on this and we're familiar. So, so this the Tehran and Santa Fe Islands are at the, the, the uh, bottom of the Gulf of Aqaba, which, which goes up and, and it basically through the Gulf of Aqaba, Aqaba is, is Israel's only access to the Red Sea. Uh, these two islands at a key choke point. And in fact, um, Egyptians, uh, you know, closing off the Strait of Tehran was what provoked the 67 war with Israel. And uh, the reason the Egyptians had control of Tehran and Santa Fe was Santa Fe was because this is originally Saudi territory. And uh, in, in 1948, uh, when Israel and the Arab, Arab neighboring Arab states were at war, Saudi Arabia, which had again, that, which was Tehran and Santa Fe or Saudi territory, King, uh, King Abdulaziz, Ibn Saud, agreed with King Farouk, head of Egypt, in 1950 to say, look, Ibn Saud said, I don't have any kind of maritime capability to defend this. Well, you take over and man this. And King Farouk said, yes. So, so in 1950, it switched over to uh, Egyptian control, essentially, and monitoring. But again, you know, in 56, during the, the Suez Canal incident, Israelis took it over. 
Uh, Israelis controlled her from 67 to 82. Um, so, it, you know, it's been a point of contention. So uh, what's happened here, and we'll, I'll get to the point why it matters, is what's happened here is that in 2017, Egypt, you know, went through, a, you know, a, a, a legislative and then ultimately just an executive decision by the, by the president to return control of the islands to Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia now has control of the islands. And, and what, what was agreed on in the 79 agreement between Egypt and Israel, that there'd be a multinational force and observers on the island, so it could never be used in an aggressive way again. So, but here's the problem. Tehran and Sanofi are within the purview, within the territorial brown, uh, boundaries of NEO. So if you're, you're doing this multi-billion dollar project, new city, a whole new initiative, you know, sort of a mind-blowing attempt to, to build something new, you really can't have this territorial dispute. Right. Right on the edge. So it's great. It's great that the U.S. has moved in here and offered to mediate. And, and you know, I think the Israelis want to just make sure it's never, it's never used in an aggressive manner again. The Israelis, I think, want to keep the multinational force on the, on the islands. Um, Saudis, you know, may or may not want to, but I'm sure the Saudis would agree it would never be used in an aggressive or um, offensive way ever again. So anyway, that's why when we talked about it earlier, is it, you know, it's, you know, the, the um, implication that this is normalization of a larger relationship is way, way, way too early. This is a, a, a an approach and a, and a, a, mar a mediation to resolve a specific dispute. A specific dispute that has the potential to sort of unlock, um, you know, a couple of other sort of domino agreements. Like, I mean, it, there's the Axios article has a great sort of rundown. I think you're actually, Richard, your rundown was really, really good. Uh, Brett McGurk from the White House, uh, White House Middle East coordinator, uh, Biden administration point person on this. Um, it's sort of an opportunity to sort of say, OK, well, if, you know, Israel is in the mix here, maybe there's a chip that Saudi Arabia can give Israel. They're talking about potentially using Saudi airspace for Israeli flights. I mean, it's the type of thing that can start to, you know, thaw relations or warm relations. But I don't think this is anything close to, hey, we're going to normalize relations over these two islands. It's definitely not that simple. And um, but very, very encouraging to see the White House in the mix here to see this sort of getting some steam um, Richard, I mean, the other point that I want to mention is one that you actually already mentioned, but these two islands are in between Neom and Sharm el Sheikh. Um, mm -hmm. and it, I believe they're un uninhabited. Um, yeah. Uh, but very strategic point uh, right at the uh, entrance of the Gulf of Aqaba. So it's, it's, it is a very interesting story. Um, and it's also, you know, it's progress, uh, for both the U S Saudi relationship, because there's some sort of thing that they can work on together here, but also just, and potentially a, a, you know, down the line, a big diplomatic victory for the United States, for Saudi Arabia, for all involved, really. I agree. It's a nice opportunity to be cooperative. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I mean, the Saudis and Israelis have been talking offline for years. And they have, they have channels and, and, and there's communication ongoing, certainly in terms of defense and security and things. Um, I, you know, I brought a little bit the normalization because it's always the Western media aspirations. But also, I'll be honest. I, you know, I think it's a little the, it, King Salman in particular feels very strongly about the Palestinian issue, as do many Saudis. But this is something that he lived with and grew up with, and it's close to his heart. And I just soon not talk about, you know, normalization, you know, as he's he's you know, he's been in and out of the hospital and there's speculation, this sort of thing. Um, but again, also, I, you know, I don't see I don't see what that what what the Israelis are going to trade for it because they're not going to they're not going to substantially rewrite their their uh, West Bank and Gaza policies. No, and just last week, I believe that IDF forces shot and killed a Al Jazeera journalist, which you know angered sure. much of the Arab world. Um, so. It's, yeah. it's, it's not as if that, that whole situation is on the precipice of peace by any means. So. And, and, you know, and I don't see, I don't see as Israel's, you know, reaching some sort of accommodation as East Jerusalem as capital of the Palestinian state, you know, yeah. in return for normalization of Saudi Arabia. I just don't know what the trade ships are. So 
Um, it, you maybe will just, as you point out, and it's, I think it's a fair point, maybe they'll just roll up these smaller accommodations and, and, and opportunities to cooperate and eventually get to a working relationship that, that is maybe sub-diplomatic or sub-normalized or sub-official. I don't know. Maybe they'll just jump to the end. But again, I don't see... Saudi Arabia has has more to consider about its choice of of normalizing relationship with Israel than to, than do UAE or Bahrain mm-hmm. or Morocco or Sudan, and they'll be more careful about it. The consequences are greater. The prize for Israel is massively greater. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know what Israel's going to trade to do it. Well said. Um, number three. Taxation, taxation, inflated prices cut the prevalence of smokers in Saudi by a third. According to the Tobacconomics Cigarette Tax Scorecard, that's a great title, Tobacconomics, <laughs> second tax scorecard report, which examined country by country data between 2014 and 2020 on the prevalence of smokers and anti-tobacco measures in place. Saudi Arabia was among the highest rated countries in the world in terms of its rating improvements between during that span, 2014 to 2020. In 2014, Saudi Arabia had ranked 0.75 out of 5, out of 5.0. But by 2020, it now ranks 3.75 out of 5 due to measures implemented in recent years. You love to see this, Richard, in a nation that has its share of macro health challenges already, like diabetes and uh, uh, obesity. Smoking is just so bad for you and quitting is apparently very difficult. Um, Saudi Arabia has done a number of things to, and this article kind of highlights it, a number of things to help curb tobacco use, a special tax on e-cigarettes in 2019, extending similar taxes introduced in 2017, which saw a 100% tax levied on cigarettes, um, leading to tobacco prices to double in Saudi Arabia. The port, the report also noted that tobacco taxes are the most effective tobacco control intervention, but the least implemented. A sufficiently large tax increase will raise tobacco product prices, making them less afford, affordable, thereby discouraging initiation, encouraging quitting, driving down consumption. This is the type of progress you want to see in Saudi Arabia if you're looking specifically at the quality of life pillar in the Kingdom's Vision 2030, which seeks to create a healthy, vibrant society. Um, very interesting story. Um, Saudis like to smoke cigarettes, some of them anyway. Um, <laughs> smoking cigarettes does make you look cool, but it is really bad for you. Um, so just an interesting story here. Um, a, a move in the right direction. I think you caught, captured it well. And, and uh, also in 2017, and along with doubling the, uh, the, the price of cigarettes, twenty a uh, pack of cigarettes, they introduced a 120% tax on energy drinks and a 50% tax on soft drinks, essentially sin taxes. So this is in 2017. You had cigarettes and then you had high, high, high sugar drinks, all in the effort, as you say, in the interest of public health. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that's good to see. And I think that's part of the quality of life, which you point out. The problem is that, that close to, you know, close to 20, over 20% of adult Saudis still smoke. So while they've made progress and they've clearly gone up in the metrics, they still have an issue with a significant percentage of the population smoking. It takes it's a huge, it takes a lot of time to change that on the macro level. Um, it does, and, but they're doing it. I don't know about packaging in Saudi Arabia. I'm pretty sure the last one of the things I like to have friends bring me from Saudi Arabia is Saudi cigarettes because I think they're so interesting. But I think they recently or somewhat recently started putting stickers and labels on cigarettes in Arabic that say, you know, similar to the US or Europe where they say this is going to kill you if you keep using it. So uh, that that type of stuff does work as well. Exactly. Um, You know, all this stuff is very, you know, is very, uh, you know, health forward and it's good for Saudi Arabia. It is, and it's it's good governance. And what you don't know in the demographics of that 20, 20 to 25% is, you know, what, what, like I said, the demographics, you don't know if there's a declining percentage among youth or, or how that's working. But mm-hmm. uh, anyway, uh, in terms of the tobacconomics meter, they're making real progress. The tobacconomics cigarette tax scorecard. Um, <laughs> that'd be a cool baseball hat to have for the be- tobacconomics <laughs> baseball hat. Um, in- interesting, interesting report here. Number four, Richard, Saudi Arabia's largest theater chain launches movie studios as MUVI. Saudi Arabia's leading theater operator, Movie Cinemas, launched movie studios on Monday and appointed Saudi film industry pioneer Faisal Baltior as its CEO. Nice. 
I, I hope that that was the case. <laughs> Movie studios will focus on developing both Saudi and Egyptian films for the Saudi public, concentrating on films for the big screen. Since its launch in February 2019, Movie Cinemas has expanded to 22 locations across the kingdom, operating 205 screens. Uh, you know, movie uh, movie cinemas and now movie studios uh, may be my, uh, you know, poster child for Saudi, the Saudi private sector economy. I mean, I just think it's stunning that I, so, you know, cinemas were reopened in 2018. Movie cinemas was opened in 2019. And this was at the time where, you know, the AMC, US, the huge AMC chain, American, had, you know, as much ballyhooed was coming in the market. And movie has outplayed everybody. I mean, it's it's uh, it's got theaters all over the country. It's expanding. It's going to do an IPO for mm -hmm. you know, and expects to be valued as much as eight hundred million. Again, this is a twenty nineteen company. Wow! And now it's moving into movie movie studios, and you know they expect to do uh, something like they expect to do a, three new movies in the in the next twelve months. And I also think it's interesting. Because as the market uh, matures and as they understand the market, remember, it only started in 2018, is that uh, Arabic, you know, Arab-based and Saudi movies really draw a crowd. And this is what they're focusing on. So it's, it's just a win-win-win in so many ways. Yeah, this opens them up to expansion outside of Saudi Arabia with content. And, um, you know, all of this growth that you just mentioned, it is a fantastic story. $800 million in value in three years. All of this has been in Saudi Arabia, so it's you know yeah. kind of amazing. Um, so the the worlds are oyster. This is um, this is a very interesting move. Good choice today uh, for this one, Richard. Well, I'm like I said, I'm a big fan of movie M U V I. Mm -hmm. Twenty two locations across the kingdom, operating two hundred and five screens, and now they're going to be doing you know uh, creating uh, actual you know theater and I mean cinema and, and film. So it's just very cool. Um, number five. Uh, Finance Minister Mohammed Al Jajan, Saudi Arabia will ultimately consider cutting VAT. Uh, Saudi Arabia will ultimately consider cutting the right rate of value added tax, which was increased to 15% for 5% in 2020. Minister of Finance Mohammed Al Jadan said this Tuesday. The VAT rate was tripled in, in 2020 to shore up finances hit by low oil prices as the COVID 19 pandemic hit global demand. Al Jadan expected that the kingdom would witness a 7.4% growth in 2022. He also expected that inflation in the country to be around 2.1 and 2.3% by the end of the year. Um, so basically a general update, but uh, I really wanted to include this because I think, I think this is an interesting consideration that they've put out there. Very interesting consideration. It's not easy to either add a new VAT or increase it. It's also not easy to decrease it or get rid of one if you have a plan to bring it back at some point. Um, this is very interesting, though. I mean, oil prices are high now in Saudi Arabia, and the VAT was really introduced because oil prices were lower and they needed to shore up government finances. But um, yeah, um, this is the first thing we've mentioned on adjusting the VAT since they raised it in uh, to 15%. And so it's interesting. They said it's not going to happen anytime soon, as you noted in, in uh, the blurb, just, you know, because they still need to shore up finances, they say. So, um, but it's interesting that it's been being floated and just generally mentioned. Well, I think it's important because um, the, every government has a compact with its people. Mm-hmm. And I think this this government, this Saudi government, is is uh, moving from a uh, positive and confidence building behavior for to the next. So, in other words, I think the pandemic, the uh, behavior during the pandemic was very positive. What we're seeing in terms of their fiscal responsibility is very positive. What we're seeing in terms of how they're signaling the private sector is very positive. When they, we have to remember that in 2016, all the GCC countries said, all right, let's all do a VAT and let's coordinate it. But of course, that's not what happened. And as of today, what you have is Oman and the UAE have 5% VATs. Um, Bahrain just went to 10%. Qatar and Kuwait have still not introduced VATs. And in this context, for Saudi Arabia to, to get into, first, initially, you know, introduce the, the, the 5% in January 2018, and then in the middle of a 
you know, a pandemic and essentially to support the economy, asking the private sector and individuals to move to a 15% VAT in, in July 2020, which again, is three times what it is in UAE or Oman and three times what it was just, you know, since, since the early 2018. It's a big ask. And it's, I think it's incumbent upon, and I think at that point, Mohammed bin Salman said, you know, at some point we will revisit this. <clears throat> but their point was, you know, the, the ask from the government was in this time of trouble, we need to up what we're drawing from you, the private sector and you, the individual Saudis. And I think part of that compact and part of that agreement, part of that endorsement of trust and the part of the responsibility of the government is to come back and revisit it and eventually back it back down. And I think if they do that, <clears throat> I think that just creates a tremendous amount of trust among, among the populace. Agreed. Now, this, is, this is, you know, I, this is a, you know, the government said this is what they needed. They said this is what they were due and they did it. And so I'm hoping that they do back it down and, and not, you know, and not too distant future. I don't know when, uh, but it, it would really, I think, reflect well on the integrity of the government and what it, it, is, it has done, what it said it would do. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. So anyway, I thought that was an important thing and, and you know, it's still speculative and, and, you know, but again, uh, that marker is out there for the Saudi government to say, all right, we, we hit you hard because we needed it, but it was on the, it was on the, the premise that we would back it back down. Sort of a nice, um, weapon to have as a form of econ economic stimulus as well down the line. You never know. And if, um, oh, yeah. you know, That's you want to just jumpstart the private sector, if you know, something happens, Hey, look, your VAT went down to 7%. Um, you know, yeah. that's a huge difference. That's yeah. a very a huge practical difference, both for consumers and for the business community. So um, it's a nice sort of like built up economic, you know, uh, it is. Weapon they, they, they have that in their pocket. You know, let's, mm -hmm. let's, let's blow up consumer spending, you know, mm -hmm. drop the VAT. Yep. I remember right before the BAT was introduced, there were a lot of stories about people going to rush to buy televisions and different stuff right before it raised because a 10% raise from five to 15 is significant. If you're buying a thousand dollar TV, it's, you know, so um, just, just very interesting story. Yeah, we'll, we will keep our eye on that here. Um, but it was interesting to see it mentioned for sure. Um, Yella number six, Richard, my favorite one, of course, Saudi Arabia is going to build a luxury yacht club and you should see this thing. It looks awesome. John Pagano, CEO of TRSDC, Amala, uh, Amala and the Red Sea Project said, we anticipate that Amala will become an international hub for luxury yachting. The yacht club required a world-class design which is on display and we'll show some pictures of it here for those of us watching on youtube influenced by the surrounding natural elements and arabic heritage and underpinned by our commitment to sustainability the first phase of the yacht club includes eight resorts offering approximately 1200 hotel rooms scheduled for completion in 2024 members of this ultra yacht uh, ultra luxury yacht club and richard i assume will be member one and two and their <laughs> guests will be able to get from their boats directly to the private sky lounge via a lift that can be accessed from the water's edge i don't want i don't want to take a step from my yacht to my bedroom <laughs> <laughs> this is this is amazing i mean this this building looks incredible um amala is a amala is one we were talking a little bit about tourism earlier amala is one of those places where the demographic and the target consumer, uh, target customer is, uh, ultra high end. Um, so this is right on brand for Amala, but, um, this is a very cool looking thing. Um, yeah. Unlike many other yacht clubs I've seen for sure. It, the, uh, the mock-up is, is gorgeous. It's quite exciting. Um, yeah. and, and you know, it's interesting cause, uh, so Amala is so the, the Red Sea uh, Development Company, which Pagano, eventually they were separate. The Red Sea Development Company and Amala were um, separate. And now they're both, John Pagano is CEO of both, has sort of been brought under the same umbrella. Amala is sort of the hyper luxury. Red Sea Project is close. I mean, they're going to have some things open up later this year, early next year. Um, in terms of tourism. So, but the Amala is that, again, that hyper luxury where you would have yachts and, and uh, you know, I think how many berths were there? 80? I think so. The renderings I, don't show them all. They just show, you know, 
five it, million dollar yachts parked right yeah. in the marina there. <laughs> in the specs. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting because you know on these giga projects, and we did a we did a little thing on which were the giga projects. Um, and you could say, you know, the the Riyadh Metro is about to be open, maybe this year, later this year. But that was started in 2014, so that precedes Vision 2030. The Jebel Omar uh, development in Mecca is huge, and it's so it's it's well down the line. The Red Sea, well, but you know, for example, the Red Sea development and Amala, but the Red Sea in particular uh, is farther along than Kadia is. Um, but I think both those Red Sea and Amala are going to get there and be usable and be show pay, showcase pe- show pieces for these giga projects and for <clears throat> Vision 2030 before some others. So it's interesting as these move along, because I think we're going to start seeing these in real life before too long, within a year and a half to two years. Scheduled for completion in 2024. I mean, that's not that far off. The Yacht Club will offer will cover 7,900 square meters across four stories featuring a terrace restaurant, infinity pool deck and rooftop cabana lounge. Um, would be really interested to see this logo that they're going to have on all their yacht merch. Do you, um, do you know if, um, uh, yeah, so Saudi Red Sea coastline. Yeah. So, um, do you know what's going to be called? Is it going to be the Amala yacht club or just, will there be another name? My second home. I'm not sure. (laughs) Um, and it's designed by HKS, which is a well-known U.S. architecture firm. It's done some fascinating things and some really exciting things. So, I mean, this is this is fun. This is this is a fun part of things. And but it is moving along. And mm-hmm. you know, the like we said, you said you know, 2024, uh, the Red Sea development will see other uh, properties before that. Uh, so it, it, it's becoming a real thing. Very cool. Richard, great episode this week. Thank you so much. Uh, Again, check out any of these segments we have. They're all on YouTube. If you want to listen to the whole hog, as we call it, um, it's all that's that's our on our podcast website, the 966 podcast.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get it. Um, But just a great conversation this week with Chris Johnson. And um, yeah, Richard, thank you very much. Good stuff. Thank you. That went fast. By the way, for our, our global listeners, we don't call it the whole hog in, you, in Muslim states. We call it the whole lamb. The whole lamb. Okay. I will update my, <laughs> no, I will no, update no. my vocabulary. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Because that's, that's a normal colloquialism here in the States. So yes, the whole hog, the whole lamb. And it all went, that's all in there. And it, did, it went by fast. This was a good one. Good one. Richard, thank you. See you next week. Thank you, Lucian.